Uh, you might find it helpful to uh, take out your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 12, uh, and also to take out your outline to follow through with the message this morning, Acts chapter 12. If you're using the church Bible, it's page 1106. We are going to sort of uh, stay in this uh, passage a little bit this morning, as I just think it's a fascinating story for us to, to dig into and to have a look at. Now, if I could ask you this question, if I was to ask, if you could ask God one, one miracle in your life, knowing that he would grant your request, no matter what you asked him, what would you ask for? What would your request be to God? Maybe it would be to put your marriage back together. Maybe to change something about your job. Maybe to heal your body or illness. Maybe to straighten out your finances. Maybe to bring a loved one to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever your request might be, do you regularly bring it to God in prayer? Trusting that he will intervene in your situation. See, I guess, I guess if most of us are honest with ourselves, that most of us have to admit that we don't pray that often about our deepest needs. Well, we get faint-hearted. Uh, we begin to pray, but we soon find our minds wandering. And we realise, or we begin to realise, or we feel that we're just using empty phrases. Our words sound hollow and shallow, and we, we start to feel maybe even hypocritical. And soon we give up. And then we think to ourselves, do you know, it seems better to live with almost any difficult situation than to continue to pray ineffectively. And we reach out to God because we know he's holding out his loving arms to us. But then we often fall back and we try to face our difficulties in our own way and in our own power. Maybe it's because at some basic and perhaps unconscious level, we doubt if God really can make a difference. That he can really make a difference in our problems that we are facing. Many of us have pressing personal needs and serious problems ravage our lives, but we don't ask God for help because somewhere... Somewhere in, well beneath the surface layer of faith and trust, we don't believe that God has the power to do anything about them. Now, of course, God is capable of handling any problem we could bring to him. Nothing is too impossible for God to handle. But he's waiting for us to recognise that power and to ask him and him alone for his help. And so as I was putting this message together and thinking about this, I, I, I looked at this really interesting occasion in the early church's life in Acts 12 about the time when they were in a very impossible situation, a pressing need had arisen and they do what they should have done and what we should do too, both individually and corporately, and that is to pray to God, to seek God. And God moves in what I think is quite an amazing and dramatic way, a most unexpected way. Now, we're in a series, as you know, called Church Is, and we've already seen that the true church is a church of God is unstoppable. It's on the mission of God. It's kingdom work. And there is a desire, there is God's desire that his church grows. We've seen also that partnership is key, that we work together. We saw last week about how discipleship is important, how we need to be intentional in our spiritual growth. And I, I reminded you again of the tools that we have, the habits tools. But what I want us to look at this morning is that the fact that the New Testament did all of those things, but was also a church that was committed to prayer. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the, fellow, to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You see, they had a promise. Jesus has said, ask anything in my name, and I will give it, that the Father may be glorified. And, and the praying here is not individual prayer, it is corporate prayer. He is talking about the prayer of the church family together. You see, the New Testament church was a praying church. And I believe that because this church prayed, God blessed it and grew it and sustained it. And so for us here at CEC, we ought to recommit ourselves to prayer because prayer is the recognition of our total dependence upon God. 
If we get hold of the, the power and the difference prayer can make, then our lives, our church, maybe our situations will be transformed. In fact, every Christian can learn to rely on the power of prayer. And I want to suggest to you three principles this morning about how we understand prayer, how we approach prayer, how we see prayer. Principle number one, follow with me on your outline, is this. Prayer must be the first thing we do. It must be the first thing we do. Now, we see this clearly in Acts 12. Now, previously to this chapter, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, has told us about one conversion after another. 3,000 people get saved on the day of Pentecost. The Samaritans, the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul of Tarsus, the Gentile centurion, uh, what's the word? Thank you. Cornelius. I was saying centurions then. What was I saying that for? (laughs) That's the original Greek. Do you not know that? (laughs) Oh, man. So, frankly, the centurions needed to get saved, but they're not here at this point. Many were getting converted. Many were getting saved. Lives were being transformed by the gospel. Things were going amazingly well. Hundreds upon thousands of people were being saved in Jerusalem. Over half of Jerusalem were now followers of Christ. An incredible amount of growth going on. But there were challenges for them. Some big challenges. They were already beginning to feel the the hurt from severe food shortage and famine, as we read in chapter 11 at the end. And to add to the tremendous problem of famine, they are now being crushed by the furious attack of Herod. Look at verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Now, the irony of it was, was that this was a political move by Herod Agrippa. And it was not an anti-Christian one. I I don't think Herod particularly cared that much about Christianity. The best that we can understand by reading about Agrippa was that he was like the rest of the Herods. And the one thing that they cared about was their own power. And, And I really believe that Herod just set out to persecute the Christians because he knew that the Jews hated them. And he thought that this was one of the ways he could get them on his side. So he went and he wanted to persecute the Christians. And he did that. He went for it. He did that in a way just so that he could endear himself to the Jewish leaders who who were so infuriated, not by what Christians taught, but by the amazing success that was going on. So he decided that he would set out to persecute these Christians who were hated by the Jewish leaders and then gain himself some great favour with the Jews. And so the Jerusalem church is really under the gun here. Herod arrests the Apostle James who was, in fact, a major figure. He was a well-respected leader in the first century church. Now, being arrested was bad enough, but that wasn't enough for Herod, because verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And Herod didn't stop there, as in verse 3 we read, when he saw that this pleased the Jews, and yes, this pleased the Jews greatly, that to have James dead, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This is good, thinks Herod. This worked once, it'll work better twice. Up the ladder, one more step to the most prominent leader of the church, namely Peter. If he could gain the advantage, the the political advantage, by killing one of them, think of the advantage he could get by killing their leader, Peter. He had no concern for right or for justice or for the law. No, it's all about self, all about him and his motives. And Peter was the key man. He was the most powerful preacher, the most dynamic apostle, the dominant force. And he could see nothing but gain by executing him. So so he arrests him. And notice, this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, why is that in there? Well, it's in there because, unfortunately, for Herod's plans, he had Peter arrested during the Passover feast. Now, respecting Jewish traditions, he did not want to execute the apostle during Passover week. So Peter was set to spend several days in prison before losing his head. Now, that's very important. Jerusalem was full of crowds. It it would have been jam-packed with pilgrims at that time. He didn't execute him immediately. He wanted to wait because it was the Passover time. And people, of course, were concentrating on Passover activity. That's why they were there. And this monumental act, which he deemed to gain himself favour, might get lost a little bit in the shuffle of Passover time. 
He wanted to wait for the, for the full drama, for the full impact, and he would therefore wait until the Passover was over and the pilgrims were just still hanging around. Now, to make sure that other Christians wouldn't try and rescue Peter, their leader, Herod made Peter's security very tight. Look at verse 4. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now, you see that? Sixteen Roman soldiers were assigned to guard him. One would have been chained to his left wrist, one to his right. Security guarded, sentries guarded the, 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 the entrance to the cell. Security very tight. Peter was helpless. He faced certain death after the Passover. Now, how many, how many squads of soldiers does it take to guard somebody? Well, it wasn't because Peter was so strong. It was because Herod was well aware that the fact that, at least from his vantage point, some group of Christians might do whatever they needed to do to release Peter. He was an important person in the church. So he has four different squads of soldiers to guard him. Notice, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. He wanted the full attention. He wanted the full drama to focus on him. It was his big moment for Herod. He would wait till the Passover was over and then he would bring Peter uh, as though there was some tribunal for for public trial and judgment and give it it the facade of justice. And so verse 5 says, Peter was kept in prison. Oh dear. That's it then. Not so much. Because here's the thing with God. God wasn't finished with Peter yet. He had more work here on earth for Peter to do. And Herod's efforts to destroy Peter was like like catching a ray of sunshine in a fishing net. Look at verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Do you see that? The church gets on its knees and begins to pray for Peter. James 5, 16, I love this verse. You hear me say it very often. When a believing person prays, great things happen. Prayer becomes the key to opening the storehouses of God's power in this situation. And it says, you notice here, it says in verse 5, they were earnestly praying. Literally, the Greek word here means they were praying stretched to the limit. It's used of stretching a muscle in medical terms to its full capacity. It it can mean earnest. It can mean unceasing. It can mean intense. The word is used for intense love in the New Testament, intense service, intense prayer. They They were stretched out in anguish, intensity, earnestness, praying with a total effort for Peter. I wonder, does that characterise our prayers as a church? Are we we a church that, that, that earnestly prays to God that he might break into people's lives and change them? People's lives in our community? People that we know? Do we cry out to God earnestly, seeking God, stretched to the limit? that he might use us individually as a church, that he might use us for his glory, for making an impact in this area and around the world. You see, it must have been a terrible trauma for the church as the soldiers came and and captured and took Peter away and put him in prison. For the New Testament church in Jerusalem, this was tough on them, but prayer was made without ceasing by the church to God for him. They all started praying. Now, I like that, don't you? The first thing anybody ought to do when something comes along is begin to pray. They didn't organise, you notice, they didn't organise a prison break committee. They started praying. They knew that the source of power was prayer, so they began to pray. And I mean they really prayed. Uh, They were totally absorbed, totally lost in prayer, and it continued day and night. Prayer, you see, is the as someone once said, is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. And that's so true. So they prayed. They agonised in prayer. You know, it's striking to me 
how many Christians see prayer as the last resort after everything else has failed? It's certainly true that the church has had no physical means of securing Peter's release. Herod was in complete control of the situation. The majority of the people supported him. However, for the prayer, prayer for the first century church was always a priority. It was always a first resort. One commentator puts it like this. He says, prayer properly precedes whatever other actions, if any, may be decided upon. Prayer also prevails while the need exists. In other words, those who are trusting God pray first and then act while continuing to look to the Lord. Those who trust themselves act first and then pray only in desperation to whoever will hear. That's the difference. Listen, if we want to be a church that God blesses, we must pray. Prayer should be the air that we breathe around here. Because when we stop praying, and I mean by that really praying, earnestly praying, not go through the emotions, but when we stop praying, we stop being dependent upon God. Our prayer meetings should be full to bursting. You see, when corporate prayer is scheduled on the weekly program, we should be queuing up to get in here. It should be packed up, all of us, as we come and we seek God's guidance and blessing. Prayer is essential. We must become known as a church that prays. Is known as a praying church. Let me tell you a story about a man who decided to write a book about churches around the country. He started in the north and worked south from there. Going to a very large church, he began taking photographs and making notes. And he spotted a golden telephone on the vestibule wall and was intrigued with a sign, which read, £10,000 a minute. Well, seeking out the minister of the church, he asked about the phone and the sign. And the minister answered that this golden phone is, in fact, a direct line to heaven. And if he pays the price, he can talk directly to God. Well, the man thanked the minister and continued on his way. As he continued to visit churches all around the UK, he found more phones with the same sign and the same answer from the minister. Finally, he arrived in Cow Plain. <laughs> Upon entering the church, behold, he saw the usual golden telephone, but this time the sign read, calls, 1p a minute. Fascinated, he asked to talk to the pastor. Pastor, I have been in cities and towns across the country and in each church I have found this golden telephone and I've been told that this is a direct line to heaven and that I could talk to God. But in the other churches the cost was £10,000 a minute. Your sign reads 1p a minute. Why? The pastor, smiling gently, replied, Son, you're in Cow Plain now. It's a local call. Now, I didn't say which church in Cowplay, did I? But we all know where we think. Anyway, right, anyway. But here's the thing, joking apart, seriously, we must be known as a church that prays, mustn't we? You see, as we continue to grow and develop as a church, and, and that is our prayer as an eldership team, and I'm sure for many of you here, that is your prayer too, but we must keep praying as we grow and as we develop there are more opportunities. There are more things that we can do as a larger church, but there's a danger that we stop praying, that we become dependent upon ourselves, on our abilities and our gifts, on just the size of the church and what we can do. You know, when we get a bit of success, we, we reach some people, we see the church grow, the danger is we stop relying on God and on prayer, and prayer gets put to one side. It's not that we don't pray, it's not that we, we don't see prayer as important, but we just slightly push it to one side, and we just feel it's a duty, it's something that we need to do, it's something that, well, the pastor's saying we ought to meet together to pray, so we will, or only the king people come and pray on a Tuesday, uh, whatever. We push it to one side. No, prayer must be central. It's crucial. It's one of the purposes of the church that we pray. And that's what the church did here. The New Testament church, time and time again, not just in Acts 12, but time and time again, you will read how they prayed together. 
Yes, there was individual prayers, but they were praying together. They knew the importance of encouraging and seeking God together as a church, as a family. And they continued in prayer. But it's worth noting something here that I must mention, because fervent perseverance in prayer, although it has the promise of power and effectiveness, it does not in itself guarantee the outcome. There is no reason to doubt that the church prayed just as faithfully for James, who died, as they did for Peter, who lived. The difference is not that one type of prayer worked while the other did not. The point is that God answers in terms of his will that is hidden very often from our view. In prayer, Christians do not, in any case, merely seek to get their own way. We don't pray our will be done, but we pray thy will be done. Prayer requests are set in the context, you see, of seeking God's way, trusting that he will bless us in whatever way he deems best for us. And so what happens? Well, the second principle of prayer is this. Expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. This is so true, particularly when it comes to prayer. You know, being a Christian is the most exciting, thrilling experience ever. It really is. If you're not a Christian here this morning, take my word for it. Life comparison is dull. To be a Christian, to follow Christ, when you give your life to Christ, man, it is never boring. Life with God is the most thrilling thing because God is a God who will not fit into our man-made ideas of him. He is the God of the radical, the God of the unexpected. Now look what happens to Peter in verses 6 through 11. You see, the evening before he he scheduled for trial and execution, the Christians were at at the home. They meet at the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, to hold this all-night prayer vigil. And even while they were praying, here's the thing, God is working. God in his marvellous power has been affecting his purposes. Verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, remember Passover was now finishing, now was the perfect moment of drama, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. This is a night, remember, that he's going to be brought forward for some mock public trial and the next day to be executed. And I love the fact that it says that Peter was sleeping. You know, to a society that spends millions of pounds on a year on sleeping pills, this is, this is shocking. He was sleeping. That's how confident he was in God. When he said in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your cares on him for he cares for you, it wasn't something he hadn't practiced, by the way. He was sleeping, chained to two soldiers and guarded. And he knew the timetable. He knew the Passover was over. He knew what was liable to come. But it never disturbed his rest. He was like the old saint who was sleeping through a horrible storm in a boat. And somebody said, aren't you concerned? And he replied, the psalmist said that the Lord never sleeps and never slumbers. And if that's true of the Lord, there's no sense in both of us staying awake. And that's true, isn't it? That's the difference, the power of God made in Peter's life. While imprisoned, Peter was so full of faith and peace that he could sleep deeply. Even though he thought he was going to be executed the next day. Now, it's tough to sleep on a jail floor. I don't know if I could sleep there anyway and have two guys chained to you. Can you imagine the pain of having to sleep chained to two guys hooked up to you? And I'll tell you something else. It would be a little rough to sleep the night before your execution, but he's asleep. He is sound asleep. You say he's just dozing. No. Uh, The angel came in and had to poke him to wake him up. In fact, the angel arrived in a, in a minute and lit the whole place up and never, Peter never even realised it was going on. The angel had to start poking him. Come on, get up, get up. He got all the way out of the jail before he knew what he was doing. He thought he was dreaming the whole thing. He was really out of it. Somebody once said, if you can keep your cool while all others are losing theirs, you just don't understand the situation. Well, That's not true of Peter. He knew what was going on. He knew what was happening. But he is also someone who knew the power of God in his life. Do you know that? Can you trust God in difficult circumstances? Are you sleeping peacefully in difficult circumstances that you're facing at the moment? 
Peter was a man of faith. He, he was a man of prayer. He, and he wouldn't, by the way, been in the prison cell doing nothing. What would he have been doing? He'd be praying seeking God too. And yet he was, he was taken by the surprise in the way in which the church's prayer was answered. Because verse 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. And angels and light are very often associated. You know why? Because they spend their time in the glory of the presence of God and they radiate it when they come out of his presence. Remember when, when Moses went up and saw the glory of God on the Mount of Exodus? He came down and it was all over him. Well, angels who have been in the presence of God radiate God's glory. Celestial beings and the glow of God go together. So this angel comes into the prison and he lights it up. And then that didn't even wake Peter up at that point. He was so out of it, nothing happened. So he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Now he's in such a sound asleep. An angel suddenly appears and has to strike him to wake him. He whacked him a good one. And then he helped him up. Come on, get up, Peter. Wrap your cloak around you. Follow me in the vernacular. We're out of here. Let's go. You know, here he is, sleepy, bleary-eyed, staggering along after this sort of shiny angel with his clothes on, half-cocked. Probably thinks he's in a dream. Well, he says he thinks it's a vision. He's in a total fog. And you can see what co contribution he made. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guards. It doesn't tell us how they did that. They just did and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened up for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Strong, massive, outside iron gate. It just opened of its own accord. See? You see, all of Herod's power was no contest for God. He burst that gate open with the breath of his mouth. He, he shattered those shackles. And then the angel, who had done his task, ministering to the saints, as Hebrews 1.14 says, angels do, just disappeared. He, he's gone. We need to be reminded that no prison can hold the servant of God whom God wants free. No prison. As I was preparing this message, I, I, I came across, I read this, this, of this experience of a, a saintly Indian by the name of uh, Sundar Singh. By order of the chief lama of a certain Tibetan community, he was thrown into a deep well, the lid of which was locked securely with a lock. He was left there to die, like many others before him, whose bones and rotting flesh lay at the bottom of the well. He would die for his faith in Christ, for preaching Christ. On the third night, when he'd been crying to God in prayer, he heard someone unlocking the lid, and a voice spoke, telling him to take hold of a rope that was lowered down. He grasped it, and found a loop at the bottom which he could place his foot in. His arm was injured when he was thrown down, so he held on with one arm and put his foot in the loop and was pulled up. The lid was replaced and relocked. And he wrote this. When I looked around, I couldn't find anybody to thank. Well, the morning came, and he returned to the city where he'd been arrested, and he started preaching again. News was brought to the Lama who denied that it could ever have happened since the key to the well was attached to his very own belt. No prison, if God wants him, no prison will ever keep his Christians, his preachers, his workers, will never keep them in there. And that's what happens here. You see, Peter's all alone in verse 11, and I love this. It says, then Peter came to himself. In other words, he finally woke up. He suddenly realized where he was and what was going on, and he says, now I know about, without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. This angel had done his job with Peter, got him out of there, just turned him loose in the middle of the street. Here he is in the middle of the night, in the middle of the street, half awake, doesn't really know what's going on. No wonder it must have seemed like a dream to Peter until he realized what had happened. God had answered the prayer of his people. The unexpected had happened. But you see, that's the point. God is the God of the unexpected. See, as you begin to rely on the power of prayer, you will also realize that God can do some pretty amazing things. And often they are of the unexpected kind. This is, only, this is only because we think so small. 
we, we try and put God in, in a little box, or we try and put him in our sort of what we think should happen, and we try and say, well, God, if you just do it like this, that would be good. And yet, as Ephesians 3.20 tells us, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is a work within us. God will do some incredible things and will answer some incredible prayers. Why? Because he is the God who can do more than we can hope for or imagine or ask for or imagine. And we need to believe that when we pray. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you pray? We need to believe that God is going to do something incredible in this church and pray expecting it to happen. Remember James 5.13? I encourage you to memorize it. When a believing person prays, great things happen. So principle number one, prayer must be the first thing we do. Principle number two, expect the unexpected. Thirdly, principle number three, accept God's answer to your prayers. Accept God's answer to your prayers. I love this part of the Acts 12 story. Imagine the scene. Baffled, Peter's looking around him. Was this real? Was he really free? Had an angel really opened those prison doors? And then when the truth began to sort of dawn on him, he made a beeline for the gathered believers at Mary's house, verse 12. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. He makes his way through the the narrow streets to one of the chief meeting places for the Christians in Jerusalem, namely the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And he goes there because he knows the believers will be there. Now, why does he do that? His first reaction would be to get out of town, wouldn't it? Go and let God worry about confirming something to the believers. Just bail out. But he he began to think about it. He began to look at it and see it in perspective. He says, no, no, I've got to get to the house where the believers are gathered to pray, and I've got to tell them. Why? Because those Christians were being persecuted, weren't they? Uh, it It was tough. It was hot in Jerusalem. And you know what they needed more than anything else? They needed two things. Firstly, they needed to know that God was still in control. And secondly, they needed to know that God answered prayer. They've been praying for Peter for a few days now. They hadn't seen anything happen yet. And if the church, under persecution, didn't have confidence that God was still in control and that prayer was, and that prayer was still being answered, they would be really shaky. And so Peter knew in his mind, I've got to go see them. I've got to go and tell them. I've got to confirm how powerful God is and God answers prayer. So Peter goes to the house and then he knocks on the door and a servant girl named Rhoda answers the door. Hear his, vo- his voice. Have you read this? Have you seen the humour in this? She forgets to open the door and instead she goes running to the rest of the believers to tell them that Peter's at the door. Look, verse 13. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. She's so excited, she forgets to open the front door. So there he is, he's there, he's still standing outside in the street, he doesn't know what's going on, she's so thrilled, why? Answered prayer. Answered prayer. God answered our prayer. Peter's at the door. Now let me show you, let me show you the depth of their faith. Verse 15. You're out of your mind, they told her. I mean, we're supposed to believe God answers prayer? When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Do you see that? They literally invent a theology here to accommodate their unbelief. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Aren't you glad that God answers fervent but faithless prayer? I think mine are often like that. I think sometimes I have more zeal than faith at times. And what you can imagine when all the gang arrive at the door, what a commotion. Oh, Peter, Peter, you know, all that sort of stuff going on. And he goes, shh, shoo, shoo. That's what he does. Look at verse 17. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And the word motioned in the Greek means down. So he's sort of going, no, 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 shoo, shoo, look, go away, look. Because they're all at the door and they're all going, oh, it's Peter, it's Peter, where is Peter? And he's going, no, 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 the neighbours, come on, look, be quiet. So he tells them to be quiet. And described how the Lord brought them out of, out, brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Wasn't that a testimony meeting? 
They all sat down and they said, what happened? Tell us. And, and he starts telling them about it. When I was here, I was in the prison, I was chained to these two guys and these two guards and they were a bit smelly and but you know and then all of a sudden and, and my chains fell off and I stood up and there's angel there and all this and that and that and he gives them this tremendous story they needed to know that God still answered the prayer when you're in a time of pressure and you begin to pray and you pray for a few days and you don't see anything happening what's the tendency you have in your mind to doubt God isn't it And God said, I want to confirm that I'm there. And so God took the time to send Peter there, even though it was treacherous because he knew that these people, these other Christians, the church, need to know he answered prayer. That's why Peter tells them to go and tell James, and they're different James, and the others in the wider church. He wants all of the church to know that God answers prayer. In the midst of all of this, they learn that God delivers his own. God is more powerful than Herod and all his walls and all his prisons and all his gates and all his chains and all of his guards. And so they report to James. And this highlights something that all Christians experience in their personal and faithful prayers. There are times when we pray, truly believing that God is able to do what we ask for and even to do more, immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine, yet with a feeling that what we ask for is humanly impossible. Then when God does the impossible, we can hardly believe it. Until the facts overwhelm our doubts. It was, it was by a mighty miracle that Peter was freed from prison. The believers didn't believe he was free until they saw him, and the facts proved that God had answered their prayers. And the same can be true for us. We pray... And God answers. He even answers some of our wildest prayers. But sometimes we struggle to believe. However, when we do, when we do believe, we stand back amazed at what God has done. We see his power, we see his might, and we glorify him and we praise his name. Friends, nothing is impossible for God. F.B. Meyer wrote this. He said... The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Friends, let us be a church that prays, that really prays. Pray prayers of praise, prayers of thanks, prayers of request, prayers for guidance, prayers for wisdom, prayers for the lost, prayers that ask God to grow this church, prayers that ask God to grow us spiritually. Because when we pray, when a believing person prays, when a believing church prays, great things happen. Church is prayerful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful passage. A wonderful example of you working in answer to your people's prayers. Lord, may we never forget as we read this passage that this is a real situation. This is a real traumatic, difficult situation. And yet, Lord, you moved in mighty power because the church prayed, because the church sought you, and you encouraged them because you answered their prayers. Lord, may we be individually, but also together a church that prays, that we seek you together, that prayer for us is the first thing we do. It's not the thing that we do if everything else has failed, but we pray first of all to you. It's always you, always coming to you in prayer because it reminds us of our total dependence upon you. May we also be people who expect the unexpected, recognising that there's nothing impossible for you, that we pray in faith and then we expect you humbly We expect you to work in ways that we perhaps don't expect, in ways that we wouldn't have thought is the best way, but we know that you always have the best for us. And therefore, Lord, may we be people that accept your answer to our prayers. It may not be the answer we first pray for, and it might not be the answer that we expected. But we do know, Lord, that however you answer is always the best, because you always have the best for us. 
Lord, would you encourage us in our prayers? If we've become faint-hearted, if we've given up on a particular area that we've been praying for or a person we've been praying for, Lord, would you renew our enthusiasm that we might seek you in prayer? And Lord, may we together as a church seek you in prayer, trusting you to answer, trusting you to give us the guidance and that we would pray not just one time, but continue to be in prayer. Pray without ceasing, as the Apostle Paul tells us. Because we are dependent upon you and you alone. Lord, we praise you for all that we've learned this morning. Lord, may we apply it to our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's close.